what will I be talking to you today? Um, in essence, what I'm showing you here, uh, what we're showing, yeah, what I'm showing you here is a uh, non-invasive temperature sensor. Um, and in a, and and this is what I firmly believe is is um, just as we say here is is a principle or a physics principle that could really eliminate the need for thermal wells, and that's what I'm going to spend most of the the core of today's um, talk is really actually going to be on trying to explain that physics. Mark has made it very clear. We're all engineers. It's a lot about does this really work? What's the basis for this? Um, before I begin, I need us to just do an exercise. You guys are, um, a lot of you instrumenta instrumentation engineers, process engineers. Um, I need us to just take a step back. And so, you know, the the the, the field that I look at, the, the what we call this entire um, um, sort of field of sensing is non-invasive sensing. So imagine if you never had to put a hole in, your pi in, in, in the piping that you use in your process facilities to get a measurement again. In essence, what would happen if you turn the pipes into the sensor itself. That's the fundamental sort of paradigm shift that we're saying what we're talking about here. And of course, no hole solves many problems when it comes to temperature. You know, imagine if you didn't have to shut down to act for you for your uh, for your operating facilities, your brown field facilities today, if you didn't have to shut down to get an accurate and repeatable temperature measurement. Um, if you could have it, you know, if you don't have to put in holes, it's inherently safer. Um, if you actually dramatically in reduce the engineering and installation time for temperature measurements that you do today. Um, and in a similar way, you know, this is one thing that I'll also harp on and I'll explain at least the basics of all of this is that if you didn't need different size thermal wells for all the variations of the plant piping that you actually have uh, in your facilities. And of course, then this naturally, if this principle works, it naturally translates to reduce stocking requirements, everything else. It really simplifies temperature measurement in the process industry. So why I asked you to do this is I just wanted us to imagine again, you know, the goal is that we'd go beyond only temperature, you know, flow we know already exists. There may be even um, um, some uh, ultrasonic flow meter suppliers here, um, but there's systematically we can go through all of these uh, process parameters to see if you can actually start using that that pipe or your assets as the sensing. The first thing that we know we can do is temperature and that's what I'm going to focus on right now is really what do we do for temperature measurement today and what do I what do we think um, we should be doing in the future so I'll start off with this I think most of you I make the assumption that most of you are familiar with how we do temperature measurement in the process industry today the the go-to approach is not very different from how we measure temperature in for instance if I wanted to measure the, me the temperature in my coffee cup or the temperature of a baby, which is I have to stick it inside the body in order to get that kind of measurement. Um, and that's what we essentially do in the process industry too. We take a, um, we have a thermal well or a protruding uh, unit that's put into the process flow. Inside it, we put a temperature, the actual thermometer or the RTD temperature sensor that we put into it. And then of course we have a transmitter on top or we take the signal off to the control system. Um, thermal wells have been the mainstay. I mean, for the last, since I've started this role, I've been trying to find out where thermal wells originated. Um, haven't been, if anyone in, in the call knows the history of that, I'd really like to know. I've got some ideas from colleagues from Dow. Um, but at this standpoint, there's many different kinds of thermal wells suited to the many different conditions that we have in the process industry. So the way I'd say it, there are advantages, there are accurate measurement in various flow situations. Um, why do I say accurate? Again, <laughs> It is, there's a lot of things that we do from basic engineering to ensure that they're act accurate if you um, if you follow the correct steps in order to get your measurement. Um, easily replaceable. I mean, the fact is it's in your process. You can pull it out for for the entire life cycle. It's a you know it's a very simple um, uh, um, way of being able to maintain and ensure that your temperature measurement is correct. And the last thing is probably for a lot of you in the call, at least everything that I've known, it's been the mainstay of how we do temperature measurement. It's an established industry and supplier base worldwide, and it's what we do today. But we do live with drawbacks from this. The first of the drawbacks is that in, in, in essence, we do have to engineer these thermal wells. And this is part of what you see over here. For instance, you've got to make sure that that unit not only 
um, withstand all the process conditions that you have, but you've got to look at worst case scenarios and the entire life cycle of your entire process facility. A refinery that's designed 40 years ago has a completely different product that even is going through it right now. Um, and you've just got to make sure that that you take into account all these aspects because that thermal well is in your um, is in your your process fluid. Um, of course, there's well established standards for this, so once again, it works, right? Um, there's the other aspects of it. If you don't take care of this, then you guys know it, and and you know I'd love to know at the end of this talk if there's anyone who's actually experienced a thermal well failure as such, um, just just out of pure curiosity. But in general. Um, you've got erosion, wear, um, corrosion being a big issue. And the big thing I say is that all of this is going on underneath that pipe surface or underneath in your process. And there's no real way of telling if something's going to happen or not other than doing your inspections. And of course, if something does happen, um, this is just an example that I could find of catastrophic damage and how you have to deal with it locally. I don't think that's necessarily the way you, <laughs> you would deal with it, but it's just an example. However, um, so these are thermal wells, and we know they've existed for the longest time. What do we, is there, is there a non-invasive, again, non-invasive means we use the pipe, is there a non-invasive approach of measuring temperature today? And if we, if this was an interactive conversation, I'd be asking you that, because most, peop, most people um, do come up with the answer, but I, I'm going to presume that you know about these, is that yes, there's always been an approach called skin temperature sensing or surface sensors, um, that have existed for just as long as thermal walls. Um, what are these? So it's an example over here, which is your pipe, and you have a uh, RTD or a, um, uh, a a sensor that is, in essence, goes along the pipe and measures the wall temperature of the pipe. Yeah, my question to most engineers and most um, even you know all the the instrument engineers, the instrumentation or process engineers that I talk to too is, this is a safer method. This is a method where you don't have to drill a hole. Why don't you measure this? Why don't you use this more often than the thermal well? Um, and the answer is usually the same. Um, these sensors are called skin type sensors. They're supposed to measure the wall temperature of the pipe. They're inaccurate. They've got poor response times, which means they're slower. And one of the biggest disadvantages is they're sensitive to ambient conditions, which is in essence, true, right? In the end, you've got a sensor on the pipe, and what you're measuring is the average temperature between the ambient conditions and your actual surface temperature. Not to, you know, and that's just the first part. The other part is what, you know, is it really measuring the uh, medium temperature? Is it measuring the wall temperature? What's the actual, what's the correlation? Um, one thing I can tell you is that these sensors can be very good. And a lot of people also tell you that, wait, but if, if I, know how to mount these surface sensors if I insulate them correctly, if I ensure that um, that I, you know, as you can see over here, that I go along the pipe surface, um, I can get a good measurement. Now, if I use, oh, for instance, if I use heat conductive paste such that I, you know, decrease the thermal resistance between the sensor and the pipe, we can get a good measurement. That's true. Exactly. So you need people who really do know how to use these sensors in order to get a good measurement from them. And even that, you can't really guarantee if that measurement is still going to be good um, in the long run. Now, once again, I'm not talking about very high temperature sensors, so furnaces, um, the stuff that you use on your cracker units, et cetera, where you're trying to measure, where in essence, you do have to measure the wall temperature of a particular unit. Um, there's also a certain science behind that 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 um, uh, that is well known um, today, but that's that's probably the most prevalent way place where we definitely say yes, we use surface sensors. OK, um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask Mark or anyone. I hope I'm not talking too fast. Mark is. Is it OK? Yeah, good for me. Thank you. OK, I'll just he'll just be the reference. If anyone uh, disagrees, do let me know. Um, so in essence, these are the two disadvantages, inaccurate, too slow, and sensitive to ambient, or three um, uh, disadvantages, sensitive to ambient conditions. So the the challenge now is to say, OK, can we really, I mean, this is a non-invasive approach. This is the best we have. Can we overcome these challenges, right? I'm going to take a step back, and this is probably the most, I mean, we want it to be technical. This is probably the um, the most technical part of this, this um, uh, uh, 
uh, presentation. Um, what I'm going to ask Mark to do is I'm going to put in uh, Mark, if you could just put the link in the chat to a uh, journal publication, just so this this publication just basically underlines the physics behind everything that I'll be presenting today. And for any of you who want some bedside reading, that's you know there's a lot more from equations and and interesting physics in that um, that document. Um, but anyway, let me start with a very simple question. If we eliminate the thermal well, what we do is we measure the surface temperature of the pipe. We turn the pipe into a sensor. So let's ask a very theoretical, simple theoretical question that we could do on the back, you know, back of the hand calculation on a on a um, uh, on a piece of paper or sorry, but a simple calculation. And the theoretical question I could ask is how accurate and repeatable can a surface measurement be um, for the process temperature in a pipe? So let's just take a schematic of a typical pipe. We take ideal boundary conditions, so we assume that it's insulated. Um, ideal, again, not necessarily perfect insulation, but let's assume uh, the insulation is, is perfect. Um, here's just a schematic where you have the insulation, you have the pipe wall, um, and you have a process medium. And note, I'm saying a flowing process medium. Why do I say a flowing process medium? Then you do have a um, at least a a, a homogeneous or not homogeneous, a, a predictable um, thermal field inside the process. So once again, this is just a schematic of it. And you've got, you know, several temperatures. If you go from the from the middle or the bulk temperature of the process going outwards, you have the process temperature, the inner wall temperature, the outer wall temperature, and of course the ambient temperature outside the insulation. Now, if you were to approach this from a heat transfer problem, what you'd be looking at is you can, you know, the analogy to this is you can represent the um, you can re represent the thermal resistances of of uh, uh, of these of this structure if you're going out from the center going outwards by a simple electrical circuit uh, of temperature points and um, and what we call lump resistances. Let's put it like that. So in essence, going out from the medium, you have a thermal resistance that is generated by the boundary layer of the fluid um, in contact with the pipe inside. So we'll call this the boundary layer thermal resistance. Then moving from here to the outside of the wall, you have the thermal resistance of the wall, and then moving out from the wall through the insulation, you have the thermal resistance of the insulation. And in between, you have these points, right? So this is just the electrical analogy of the equivalent. Now you can play around with these equations, um, and you can come up with something very interesting. So we could reorganize it in such a way to say that the 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 temperature difference between the medium of the pipe and the surface is equal to the difference between the medium and the ambient multiplied by a ratio of all these thermal resistances now it's a fairly simple you know equation as such but you know please don't get um it, it, it's a fairly you know linear equation that you can see here um the main thing that I just wanted you to notice is this. For instance, if you look at this denominator over here, if your boundary layer resistance and your wall resistance are much, much smaller than the actual insulation resistance, then it's the same as saying, assuming that this was say about 100 times more than, you know, than the actual um, uh, combination of the boundary layer and the wall. So to give you an example, um, the resistance of an insulation can be a hundred times more than steel. Steel is a very good conductor of heat, so you can imagine that that resistance to the wall is really small. Um, in essence, what you would have here is a very small value divided by a very big value, which means that you tend to zero. So this means just theoretically, with a very simple calculation, you could see that if you insulate the temp, if you insulate a pipe the temperature difference between the medium and the surface can be can actually be zero. Now, this is an interesting find, which means that, of course, you need to have models for the boundary layer, for the wall, all this other stuff for it. But this is just as long as your insulation is is significantly more than the actual um, uh, temperature of your than the actual um, thermal resistance of your of your wall and fluid, you could theoretically use the outer surface of the pipe to measure your process temperature. Now, this is what we use as, so, so in essence, a surface measurement can be as good as an invasive measurement. Now the question is, let's go through some of these details in here. So what do we do? We're building on exactly this physics. So, so how do you get a non-invasive measurement? The way, and I will show you how we've 
um, uh, solve this. And again, this can be the, pro the, the method by which you could actually solve this problem to eliminate a thermal is the following way. So this traditional measurement is what you do is you measure the, you know, you put a thermal wall in and you're measuring the process fluid in, in the way that we would sort of imagine how we always do it even in everyday life. The alternate way is that you measure the surface temperature of the pipe and you sort of digitalize the actual thermal wall measurement or you predict what the actual process temperature is based on a surface temperature measurement of the pipe. Now, what does this mean in essence? If this does work, it's a simpler, safer way of doing your uh, process measurement without compromising on the actual performance, because once again, we're turning the pipe into a sensor. So, you know, not to go, you can see all these, these details as such, but, this, the, but, the, but what I wanted to tell you here is that with this kind of approach, whereby you don't, you know, you literally just take out the inset from the thermal wall and you contact the pipe, you're, what we're going from is what is a hardware, what is a, a, well there to what we call the model-based approach. And it's this model-based approach that I'm just going to give you uh, a few details about right now. So what is this approach that that uh, non-invasive measurement could do? And of course, that's what we're doing from an ABB standpoint, but I'm just reinforcing it from the standpoint of engineering. So what do you currently do for a measurement? Um, building on what I discussed before, so let's assume the same pipe, you've got a little bit of insulation on it, you've got, this is the cross-section of a pipe, and you've got a flowing medium. Our customers, um, your customers, process engineers, what you want to know is the medium temperature. Um, and what we do today is we put a thermal well inside, and inside this thermal well, we put an RTD. RTD or, or your, um, your, your uh, temperature sensor. This is what we do today. Now, just as you, you know, there's, there's something that was pretty, uh, pretty shocking, uh, if you ask me, for, for, Temperature is one of the oldest measurements that we have, but um, but there's a chance for error that can uh, that can happen in virtually all facilities today, and I'm not quite sure how we can easily detect that. Um, again, I'm not talking about safety circuits or so, but but let's give the the simple example. When the first thing is, um, one must understand that when you place a temperature sensor into a thermal well, you are not measuring the medium temperature. We do a lot of things as, an, as engineers to make sure that there's a thermalization between the medium temperature, without having to think too much, right? Between the medium temperature and the wall of the thermal wall as such. But this RTD is actually measuring the wall temperature of that thermal wall. That's the first point. So, of course, there exists the chance for an error. Now, the other part of it is that whenever we talk about accuracy, if you're asked what is the accuracy of your temperature sensor, et cetera, Everyone, even the process industry, is talking about the ac the accuracy of this RTD, and I use RTD just resistive thermal device. Um, in the end, just as that sensor, everyone's talking about the accuracy of the sensor. Is it class A, class AA? Can I get a calibration? Can I get a five point calibration? And then we take this this highly calibrated, accurate device and we stick it in a black hole. And it's kind of shocking because if that hole is too large, if there's dead insects in the bottom, which can happen over the life, lifetime of the cycle. If it's too short, just because you picked the wrong, there exists the potential for an error, a measurement error that will go completely undetected unless you have another comparable measurement, again, another thermal wall right next to it, that you can compare the two. And even then, what you're really measuring is just the performance of the same sort of, you still don't know if it's the medium temperature, but both your measurements are still in agreement as such. So, you know, that's just to say, even though in the most, in, even in the most traditional uh, measurements that we have, there is a chance for error that can go undetected today that we live with today. And of course, if there's time, I will show you some of these examples because we've been confronted with them as we go along. The approach we're taking is completely different. It's to say, okay, as I mentioned to you, if, um, if you take away the thermal well, you turn the pipe into the sensor, the only real measurement that you have is the surface temperature of the pipe. So we went through the basic physics, which is to say, theoretically, how good can it be? But let's go to something more practical. So assuming you could measure the surface temperature of the pipe accurately, can you predict the medium temperature? So in essence, what you can do, what we did, um, is we developed process, a process model. Basically, this is a model that um, if that basically given that uh, a good or an accurate surface measurement um, where we 
It allows us to predict the medium temperature of the process, and it uses the exact same parameters that you would use for calculating, you know, the the um, the wake frequency for your thermal walls. So basically, the same process parameters that you do either in the design of a plant or in judging whether your thermal walls um, will work for a given application or not. So taking the same parameters, density, viscosity, flow rate, pipe material, pipe dimensions, we can <clears throat> basically calculate, okay, we can basically predict uh, for a given surface temperature what that medium temperature is. Now this is where it gets very interesting because when we developed these models, we found something very interesting. And the simple rule of thumb that I hope can, you know, that allows people to start using this simply is that if you have a liquid-like medium in a um, flowing in a turbulent regime, in a um, if you if you have a let me just repeat that. So when we worked on these models, um, one of the things that we found out is that if you have a um, liquid like medium flowing in a turbulent regime in a metal pipe, there's virtually no temperature difference between your process and your surface. So let me just repeat that again. So a liquid like medium, that means anything that has a density above 20, 30 degrees, uh, 30 kilograms per meter cubed is behaves thermally like a liquid. So liquid like medium um, flowing in a turbulent regime in a metal pipe, um, the physics models predict that there's virtually no temperature difference between your medium and your surface. I'd like you guys to just, and again, anyone could write it in the chat or just let me know how many processes in the process industries are liquid like. So even a high pressure gas has density above 30, 40. Um, how many processes are liquid like? Metal pipes, turbulent flow. Anyway, I'm going to presume that most people will say a lot. Um, so just to reiterate that, um, so in, in general, it's as simple as that. So liquid-like medium, turbulent flow, metal pipe, there's virtually no temperature difference between your medium and your surface. If you guys could answer, you would tell me that a lot of processes are like that. Right, then why do we need a thermal well? And the answer is going to be usually it's dead silence, exactly what I'm experiencing here. So, and the the return of this is, yeah, and we'll talk about that thing, that in the middle, oh, I love the questions. Um, so the problem that we ran into over here is it's something else. I, again, at the beginning of this presentation, I told you that skin temperature sensors have existed for just as long as thermal wells. They're supposed to measure the wall temperature of the pipe, but they are all too slow, inaccurate, and affected by ambient conditions. So what we also realize is it's not just that you should know this physics and be able to predict this physics, it's also that you also need a sensor that can actually accurately capture the dynamics of what the pipe is doing. And so for that, we developed what we call a model-based non-invasive um, uh, temperature sensor. So basically what we have is um, we have one temperature sensor that contacts the outer surface of the pipe. And then we have a second sensor that basically, you know, I could show you, I don't know if it actually shows up here. So here's an example of, of the. So um, in essence, what we have is in, in our sensor, we have, I think you guys can see, it, there's basically two RTDs. One of them is in contact with the surface while the other one is sort of offset from the surface by a few millimeters. And the idea here is something else. The idea here is we can develop a thermal model of the entire sensor. Um, and because we're measuring temperature at two different points, in essence, we can compensate for all the common errors that you would find with ter ter surface temperature sensors. Um, in essence, what we're doing, to put it simply, is we're measuring the ambient conditions right around this sensor and compensating for those effects. And that allows us to both accurately and in a calibratable way actually measure the surface temperature of the pipe. And because these two sensors are very close together, you can actually capture the dynamics of the pipes, the dynamic temperature change of, of the pipe itself. Um, so based on that, what I, why I wanted to tell you this is that this is one way or one approach to be able to get um, a form of non-invasive temperature sensing. So really not having to use a thermal well, but actually turning that pipe into a sensor. But to let you know, I mean, but the next step of it, one, so this is the approach that we use, which is a two-step approach, but at least it, it gives you sort of a structured method by which you can understand when and how to apply this. So the first being a process model that goes, that allows you to predict the temperature of the, the medium based on an accurate surface temperature, and then a sensor that very simply can actually accurately, and in a sort of, and I, I repeat that in a calibratable way, measure the surface temperature of the pipe, right? Now, 
this is our entire non-invasive approach. So this is what we're doing from an ABB standpoint uh, as we go and uh, uh, as we're you know moving into the market with this. But I'm going to, you know, I gave you a lot of just how this physics works, et cetera, the theory associated with it. Let me just show you um, how the physics plays out in real life. So this is, for instance, our research facility here in Germany. And what we can do is we can pump. Um, it's, it's a facility that consists of two tanks where you can heat up the water and um, you can basically pump this water from one tank to another through a metal pipe. Um, and in essence, all we what we did here is just compare. So just to give you an example, you compare a traditional thermal well with a typical skin temperature sensor. Um, uh, what I'd mentioned at the beginning of this call and what we know about, this is a glued PT100. So remember, I, I, I told you that if you, know, if, you, if you know what you're doing, you remove the metal casing, you insulate it properly, et cetera. So in this particular case, what we've done is we've just literally glued that PT100 sensor right onto the pipe. We put an insulated backing, um, something that you would do in a lab and nowhere else. But this, is the closest measurement to the true temperature of the pipe wall. And then, of course, there's our non-invasive sensor, which is this model-based approach, which builds on what you've what you, what the industry has been using for the thermal wall. So what do we do? In essence, what we do is we heat up the water and we pump um, hot water into the pipe, keeping the simple rules, right? Turbulent, liquid-like, metal pipe. And let's look at what happens when you do a dynamic step response here. So this is a, a graph of the temperature versus time. Um, at this standpoint, we open the valve, and this is where the hot water comes rushing through the pipe, just ensuring that it's turbulent. This is the typical T90 response of a thermal well. This one's a 3G thermal well from, you know, I think it's a now more standard associated with it. Um, so this is the, I think you're all familiar with this response. This is the skin temperature sensor, the common sensors that we know in, in the process industry and use. And what do you see? Exactly what people have experienced, which means very slow and inaccurate, as everyone has expected. This orange curve is that PT100 that I mentioned to you that was glued onto the surface, what we believe at least to be probably, from what we know right now, the most accurate measurement of the wall temperature of a pipe. Look at its response. That pipe responds faster than the thermal in this case. And pretty much it is almost regardless until you get to some of the, the bigger limits for any metal pipe, you will see this kind of response because the two of them scale. Remember, all I told you at the beginning is the physics model predict that if you have a turbulent liquid-like medium in a metal pipe, there's no difference between your medium and your surface. This is showing you exactly that physics. Now, because we use the same principles, we come vertically with a single point contact. Um, our sensor response is what we do, at least in these cases, to be able to match the, therm the, the thermal well performance. So why do we do this? Because the big point we want to say here is this principle that you're seeing here is that, in essence, our principle is it, our sensor, our non-invasive principle matches that thermal well performance because of the fact that you have this model-based approach between the two of them. Um, it's not, even though we are using the surface, we are still turning that pipe into a sensor. And in essence, this kind of approach can outperform any sort of traditional skin temperature measurement that you have. Now, um, so why use non-invasive? Again, guys, I mean, I'm not giving a sales spiel here, but just a pure if this is true, if this is a direction we could go to, if the physics works for the process industry the way we expect it to, it's safer, it's a lower cost of ownership on the whole, both for yourselves as users, for EPCs in terms of what we actually um, uh, deliver, sorry, lower cost of ownership for the end customers as such. Um, and then, uh, so that's safer, lower cost of ownership, it's simpler. So if you turn the pipe into the sensor, you really, the, the problem of predicting becomes dramatically easier. It's a, um, it's a very simulatable. It's a very, it's a, it's a, a sort of, um, you can have very defined boundary conditions. It's very easy to simulate. Its symmetry allows you to be able to use what we have now for computational power to be able to judge, um, really to rethink the way in which we even use temperature or other measurements in a pipe. Um, and the last part of it is that, at least what we're showing here is that for for temperatures rather you know, the, the physics is 
still very exciting, but but it's it's manageable here, and and therefore in this particular case you can you can have a high performance uh, um, uh, of your uh, of at least for temperature sensing for a lot of applications. And now I think John mentioned to me that there's um, that there's a uh, that, that some of the members are also from the EPC standpoint, and here's just a quick example of if you do go with the non-invasive, if if you know if we do shift to this, what it means for some of the savings in terms of capital expenditures, um, and that could and in general, you know, my hope is that you really don't have to think about temperature. Temperature is just something that's done at the end. Um, we can focus on the other um, um, flow parameters in order to bring up a facility faster or for a lower cost, um, or even to get insight where we didn't have it before. And of course, I'll go through these examples if you want um, um, as we talk through this. Um, so this is, again, just an example. You're looking at, at a good um, 25. So in this particular case, I think it was a 40% CapEx savings in terms of a project, right? Um, when can you use non-invasive sensors? So, so this non-invasive principle, at least from the physics, as long as you can predict the physics, you can use it anywhere, right? Because then you know what to expect. Um, and in essence, this is just a no-brainer condition. So these are the conditions under which you really don't have to, um, even as engineers, don't have to really question because the like you don't have to think about it too much because the, the physics plays in your favor, right? Um, so we're talking about now, here's a very interesting thing that I mentioned. So the pipe dimensions where this works is from DN40. So from this is just what we do for our sensor as an example. You go from DN40 up to DN2500. Why do I say that? What it means is, in essence, you go from small diameter piping to your massive diameter piping. And how is it possible that you don't need long thermal wells? You don't need all these different um, uh, variety of temperature measurement um, tools. Um, and you can just use one sensor that that sort of one you know surface sensor that gets to that. Um, the reason is because the physics scales. The physics on a small pipe, within reason, if we're not going to we're not talking about uh, micro technology here. So, uh, um, um, the physics scales whether it's a small pipe or a larger one. If you know the rules, you can scale accordingly, and that is the biggest advantage of this. Um, and in essence, that's what we've also been seeing. Um, you know, DN400 pipes, so or or the mass, the larger pipes. That's where this really makes you know quite a difference. If you could actually, if it actually works the way it, uh, we say it does here. Um, so this is under common pro uh, process conditions. This is an approach. Um, the other way that we have, and and this is for you know, I'm going to ask Mark to put this into the chat. I won't go through it here, but what we've done is we've taken this physics model and we've put it into a performance predictor online. So an engineering tool. Um, that allows you basically to um, to be able to predict what your process conditions would be. Now, as you as engineers, the only thing I wanted to say here is we've taken the physics and put it in a special in a simple tool that uses the same process conditions you do when you're when you're uh, running a facility. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to check beforehand what do you expect, what should you expect from a non-invasive measurement, and with you know the thousands or so of, of uh, the over thousand something sensors that we've had in the market right now, the physics is confirmed. So the physics is repeatedly confirmed. So we haven't. So so what you see there is what you should expect from, or what your customers or what you as engineers should expect from this kind of measurement. Um, I won't go through it here unless we do it through a question and answer session in detail. And the last bit. Um, that I'm going to do. So, so basically, it's a simple tool built on physics. And Mark, I think you will put the link into the the chat, right? It's for the My Measurement Assistant performance. Yeah, predictor. the links there for, for everyone. Okay, and then um, I'm going to do a. Um, I'll just show you one example, and I think Mark suggested that I use. Yeah, this maybe one. perhaps we we'll just answer a couple of questions before you move to the other slide, because there's some questions, Guru, on some of the slides that you were showing sure earlier. let's do that okay so i'll just open the floor guys and then let's just go to to quick um discussions on this and 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 then i'll show examples as we go forward so if you don't mind i'll, I'll just jump between slides